You're watching once again a YouTube video presentation of the University of Wyoming Center on Aging. I'm Scott Veach. I'm your host. And on this program, we'll be discussing topics of interest for caregivers of loved ones with dementia. We hope that you will subscribe to the channel and you'll hit that thumbs up like button. Both of those actions help the channel to grow and allow us to reach more people. And if you'll tap that notification bell, you'll be alerted each time we upload a new program. And now, this is Once Again. Our guest today is Harry Margolis. He has been practicing elder law and estate planning for more than 30 years. He's a passionate advocate of seniors and those with special needs and their families, and he answers their questions both in his private practice and online at askharry.info. We'll have a link down in the description box. And he is also the author of Get Your Ducks in a Row, The Baby Boomer's Guide to Estate Planning. And he's here with us today, and we're so glad. Thanks for thanks for being with us. Very glad to be here, Scott. We should we should mention first of all that even though we are going to be talking about topics that have legal aspects, that we are not offering legal advice, but rather we are uh, bringing up uh, topics of interest for those who are caring for those with dementia, and we recommend that you seek your own legal advice privately for more guidance on any of these topics. We're going to be talking mostly about the book today, and I have to come, uh, first of all, because in your preface you brought up Leo Tolstoy, the 19th century Russian author who suggested that all happy families are alike, and you don't completely agree. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he said uh, unhappy ones are not, of course. Um, and uh, but I think I think it's probably not all families are alike, whether they're happy or unhappy. Um, and uh, but I think he was uh, he was trying to introduce a story about an unhappy family and wanted to uh, let us know it was going to be very interesting. Life brings its speed bumps, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. You talked about in your book the five or six or seven essential documents. And I look at that and the first thing I think is, well, that's a lot. That's daunting. Does it have to be? No, I don't think so. And we, we, the reason we say it's five to seven is because uh, different states uh, have somewhat different rules. And, uh, and sometimes you might combine documents and sometimes you might not. And to some extent, that's a matter of, of um, taste. But, I, I, but in the book, I um, prioritize them. So which ones I think are most important and uh, so if you kind of look at it that way, um, kind of get as far as you can get, but start with the start with the mm -hmm. first one, which is the durable power of attorney. Right. And many estate planners, you said many estate planners consider the durable power of attorney to be the most important estate planning instrument, even more important than a will. Why is that? So the, the reason is that if you don't have a will, um, there's laws that uh, fill in that take its place. So and two, and two things, and I guess the other thing about a will um, is that these days, wills often don't cover a whole lot of your property. So if you have a, a retirement plan with a beneficiary designation, if you own property jointly with somebody else, anything like that, um, it doesn't come under the will. It, it, it uh, passes to whoever you name at your death um, by operation of, uh, of the, really an operation contract by the the contract you you have with the bank or investment house. So the will governs less property. And then as I say, was saying, if you don't have a will, your state law says who gets your property. So um, so if you want it to go to your closest to your spouse and your closest relatives, your children, or if you have no children to your siblings, um, then you don't really need a will. And I think wills are still important for some other reasons we can get into. But the power of attorney is much more important for most people. Are there are there different kinds of power of attorney documents? There are. So, um, but most for most people, the power of attorney is a general, durable power of attorney, and um, and and virtually today, virtually all powers of attorney are durable, which simply means that it continues even though you have become incapacitated. So. In what's called the common law, the law that goes back um, to actually prior to there being in the United States, goes back to British law. The um, when you name someone as your agent or attorney, in fact, under a power of attorney, they step into your shoes. So the 
the legal construct um, in the old days was that if, since they're stepping in your shoes, if you're incapacitated, they became incapacitated too, which didn't make a whole lot of sense because the whole idea of having a power, the, the main purpose of having a power of attorney is that, so that someone can step in and act for you if you become incapacitated. And so you don't want to, to cease being effective right at that moment. So, um, so every state passed a law authorizing a durable power of attorney, meaning it'll continue even if, you, even if the person who signed it, the principal becomes incapacitated. So, so I guess that's not a distinction between different kinds since they're pretty much all durable mm -hmm. these days, um, but it explains what that term means. When you, uh, when you have a durable power of attorney, what rights are you giving to someone else? So generally you give just about all rights to, to step in for you on legal and on uh, financial matters. So you want somebody to act for you because you don't know what's going to come up. So you want to give them as, as much power as possible. Now the states may differ a bit on uh, kind of what that means and how specific you need to be. So you'll see a power of attorney and it'll have a list of a, a dozen or two dozen different powers in it that you're granting. At the top, it says the person can do whatever I want it, I, I can do. But even though you have that general grant of power, people list lots of uh, different, or attorneys list lots of different um, powers in the document because they want to make sure whenever the individual goes to a bank, goes to convey real estate, uh, does anything they need to do, that they're not challenged. So that it's clear that they have that power, so they get listed. What's... Um, sometimes questionable and can again differ from state to state is the power to make gifts because that's actually giving property away and the uh, power to execute a trust. So, uh, so that there was actually a recent case in my state in Massachusetts about whether or not you could create a trust under a durable power of attorney. And it was a complicated decision, mm -hmm. but it was uh, it's in some ways still an open question in Massachusetts. So that can differ from state to state. If, uh, if, for instance, I would give power of attorney to my daughter, would she be able to go into my bank accounts? I mean, even though she's not on the, the, uh, the account itself, would she be able to sell my property, anything? What? Yes, she, she would. She'd have to go to the bank and sign a signature card to step in for you. Show the now documents, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you may ask, um, well, I, you don't want to give her that power today because you appear to be totally competent and who knows what your daughter might do. Uh, you just want her there just in case. Um, so why not just say in the power of attorney that it only becomes effective when you're incapacitated? And that's called a, a springing power of attorney. And so some, maybe 10% of powers of attorney are springing, um, but we usually discourage that in our practice. And the reason is that it, it creates a hurdle to, for its use. So let's say you do become incapacitated and your daughter goes to the bank and they say, well, how do we know Scott's incapacitated? And so then she's got to go to the doctor perhaps and get a statement from the doctor that you're incapacitated and the doctor's busy. Doesn't, it's not what they usually do. They're not ready to do this. And, it, and she's of course, at that moment, also probably trying to figure out how she's going to take care of you and provide care herself or move you into assisted living. She's got a lot on her plate. And to add this extra burden um, and, uh, and, as I said, hurdle just doesn't seem to make sense unless you didn't trust her for some reason. Of course, mm -hmm. if you didn't trust her, then why are you pointing her on right. this document? If, um, if, if someone were to come to you and say, if a woman comes to you and say, um, you know, my husband has just received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Where do I start? Is the durable power of attorney the first, maybe the most important document to address? Yes. Yeah. Of course, then there's going to be a lot of other things, but right. um, he may still be competent at this point. Yes. Because it's, an, because it's, a, it's a new diagnosis. So you want to get um, all these documents signed as quickly as possible while he can still understand them. And of course, I start with the power of attorney. Um, but the other documents we, we will talk about, healthcare power, healthcare power of attorney or proxy, will, revocable trust, those are also really important. Right. Let's move on to one of those healthcare directives. There's more than one, right? 
Right. So that 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 get that's where it gets a little complicated, partly because every state is different there on the on the um, financial and legal power of attorney. They're all pretty similar, but on the um, health care, some have health care proxies, some have uh, health care powers of attorney. They're essentially the same thing. They're appointing somebody to stand in for you to make health care decisions if you're unable to do so. Um, and then you talk about medical directives. Um, and sometimes people kind of use the words interchangeably, but a medical directive is really different because it's really saying what you would want um, to give guidance to your agent under the health care proxy. And that, that can be um, kind of general guidance, like I, I want to be kept comfortable, I do want to be kept alive under all circumstances, or I don't want uh, treatment if it uh, doesn't seem um, kind of the, the burden seems excess compared to the potential benefit. Or there's something called a living will. And that's kind of what's the kind of in the evolution of these documents. That was kind of the first, the first that was developed which says, pull the plug. If, yes. I, um, if I'm in a coma or in a vegetative state, usually. Um, and and this, this depends again on the, on the state because in my state, a living will has no legal power. Um, but in a lot, some other states it does. So in my state, it's, it's, it's no, no different from a medical director just guiding your, your agent. So it's something they can refer to but it's um, but they it can't be enforced without the agent stepping in. Mm. Other states are, um, have different rules, so you can't you can have uh, the healthcare proxy or power of attorney. You can have a medical directive. You can have a, a living will, and then somewhat related to that, you can also have a HIPAA release, because as you, as you probably know, um, healthcare professionals are are not supposed to talk to anybody, not supposed to release your medical information to anybody without your permission. And that's what, that, what we're going to get to next here, right? We're, okay, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to tell people that here. our guest is Harry Margolis. He is the author of Get Your Ducks in a Row, The Baby Boomer's Guide to Estate Planning. It's available on Amazon. We will have the uh, the link below so that you can follow along on that. And uh, it'll be in the, the dialogue box. We, uh, we invite you to subscribe to the channel. This is once again, a YouTube video presentation of the University of Wyoming Center on Aging. If you will subscribe to the channel and hit that thumbs up like button, both of those actions will allow our channel to grow and to reach more people. And if you'll tap that notification bell, then you will be automatically notified each time we upload new content. On to a HIPAA release, <laughs> boy, uh, I that seems complicated to begin with. Is it even more complicated when you're working with a dementia patient? Well, again, they have to still be competent to sign it. Um, so, um, so it depends where kind of where they are along on the dementia. So, if you if you have appointed uh, somebody under healthcare proxy or healthcare power of attorney, usually a HIPAA release is incorporated in the document, so they have the right okay. to see your medical records. The the issue. Um, families often face is uh, often a parent has appointed one person to that role. But if somebody's hospitalized, they're there all the time. And it can also be, a, it can often be a problem because they may have other different family members coming by at different times and, and they may not be able to talk to the medical personnel about what's going on if they're not the actual agent. And we think it, Makes sense to appoint a broader number of people on the HIPAA release just to facilitate uh, communication and information. Also, it can happen that we, I mean, this seems to be less true than it used to be. When, when HIPAA um, first got passed, um, medical professionals were really putting their hands up and not mm -hmm. talking to people. Um, I think that's less of a case now, but sometimes. Um, somebody will present at, a, at an emergency room and the medical personnel there don't really know the person. Or in most cases, they probably don't know the person. So if they seem a little um, frail and doddering, they don't know that that's not their permanent situation. No, they don't know that they were out uh, uh, playing tennis and uh, having a great time the day before. Um, they just see this this older person, perhaps, who uh, seems a little incoherent. And unless the, they're willing to talk to family members, 
and hear what the, hear the situation and hear um, and know what medications they're taking and uh, all the and all the background information, um, it could be a real problem for their care. And we've seen med medical personnel, perhaps because they're just uh, overworked and harassed, tell family members, "I can't talk." Because because uh, uh, this is uh, I'm barred by HIPAA, which is misconstrues HIPAA. HIPAA doesn't say you can't listen; it just says you can't share information. So they can still listen to what family members have to tell them. Mm -hmm. But it's good to have the HIPAA release in hand just in case they're claiming that that is kind of a defense to being you know, pestered or bothered. So um, so that's a, one of the main reasons we urge a broader range of people. Uh, to be put onto the HIPAA release. Talk about HIPAA release, durable power of attorney. What about wills? What's the purpose of a will? You mentioned several. Yeah, so so the main purpose of a will is to appoint a personal representative or, or executor to be in place after you die to take care of everything that has to be taken care of, whether that's um, paying for the funeral, uh, distributing personal assets, uh, paying bills, collecting assets, and ultimately distributing them. That's the main purpose, to have somebody in charge. They also have, will have to sign your final income tax return. So okay. there's a lot of stuff to clean up at the end, and it's good to have one person or maybe two people together working together in charge. The other thing a will does, of course, it says who gets your stuff. Mm -hmm. So that can be your, again, your personal, your what's called the personal tangible property, which is basically anything you can touch. So your jewelry, your clothing, your furniture, your silverware, um, your car, uh, your boat, all that is uh, personal, tangible property. And it says who gets that. Who and gets then, that uh, and you can also else. designate who doesn't get your stuff. <laughs> you, you could do that. Yeah. You, uh, well, you, you can put in what's called an interim clause. So if, uh, if um, say, Scott, you didn't want me to get anything, you could say that, uh, that if I challenge the will, Whatever I get uh, gets uh, that 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 bequest gets deleted. Of course, you have to give me something to have some incentive not to challenge the will, but uh, maybe not my full share. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so that's uh, that. So you, you can you can you can put that in the will if you need to, to protect the personal representative. And Let's go else. on to uh, revocable trust, and you are a big fan of these. Why is that? Yeah, you know, yeah, I become more of a fan the longer I've been doing this. Because so revocable trusts, well, first of all, trusts, I have another book just on trusts because um, you can do whatever you want with a trust, basically. They're very, they're, they can be very creative documents. But the typical trust for estate planning is a revocable trust that simply says it's for, for you during your life and who gets what your, your whatever assets are in the trust when you die. And, it, and it, it makes it easier when you do pass away um, because um, everything's in the trust, it's, everything's been collected, and uh, the, the executor or personal representative has, doesn't have to go through retitling everything and going to every bank and uh, getting on the title. Um, but it's all, they're also very, very useful during life because even though the power of attorney is, is a, as we've discussed, is a really important document, it's a little cumbersome, and some banks and financial institutions give people a lot of trouble honoring them. Um, but it means the person you appoint has to go to your bank, sign a signature card, go to Fidelity or Charles Schwab, whatever your investment house is, sign another signature card, go to go to all these places, um, and, and get onto these accounts and gain control. One of the great things about revocable trust is when you set it up, you're going to do all that to begin with because you're gonna to have to retitle all of your assets into the trust. So the, so you're gonna make, so you're gonna take those steps and then your daughter doesn't have to do that. So if she's the point, person appointed as your, your um, successor trustee, she doesn't have to do that um, as, as much because you've consolidated everything usually as part of the process. In addition, if you're comfortable naming her as your co-trustee, then she's already on the accounts. And then she also has access to the accounts to make sure um, she's aware of if something goes wrong, because as you, as you probably know, seniors in the US are targeted by scams all the time these mm -hmm. days. And, and family members don't know what's that is happening often until it's too late. 
But if they're on their on the accounts, they can keep an eye on them and make it, and they can't may prevent it from happening, but they can keep it from going too far. We so, knew that that there was going to be a lot of information to discuss in a in a short amount of yeah. time to do that. So <laughs> we're coming to the to the end of, of part one of this discussion. And again, we're not offering any legal advice, but these are all general enough uh, topics that an attorney in any state should be familiar with them, correct? A, yeah, definitely a, a state, state planning attorney. attorney. A planning yeah. attorney, yes. Yeah, you might not want to go to criminal law. Attorney right, right. <laughs> That's right. And, and vice versa. <laughs> we, uh, we've we talked about durable power of attorney, health care directives, the HIPAA release will, and revocable trust. And we're going to be getting in part two into a discussion about long-term care, special needs, and asset protection. Those are the things that are coming up in our next segment. Our guest um, is Harry Margolis. He has been practicing elder law and estate planning for 30 uh, years or more. He is a passionate advocate for seniors and those with special needs and their families. He answers their questions both in his practice and online at askharry.info. That link is down below. He is also the author of Get Your Ducks in a Row, The Baby Boomer's Guide to Estate Planning, and we will have a link to Amazon on that uh, as well. Thank you for being with us for part one. We'll have part two coming up next time. You've been watching once again a YouTube video presentation of the University of Wyoming Center on Aging. We hope if you haven't done so already that you'll subscribe to the channel and hit that thumbs up like button. Both of those actions help the channel to grow and allow us to reach more people. And if you'll tap that notification bell, you'll be alerted each time we upload a new video. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Scott Veach. We'll see you again next time.